So I have the uh, dubious honor of being sandwiched between uh, Pascal's talk and uh, Adnan's talk, but we'll be looking at flow diversion, uh, which um, is a, a big theme. Uh, I'm going to talk about the general concepts, currently available devices. We'll touch on some of the uh, non-FDA approved devices that are floating around, um, getting trials done in the US and also overseas, and then a few little technical nuances in some cases at the end. So the basic concept of flow diversion is direct to direct uh, blood flow away from the aneurysm uh, with uh, slow thrombosis in the aneurysm over time. Um, we can increase the amount of flow diversion either by having more braids in the stent or by putting more stents in situ. Um, and a lot of studies have been done both in the lab and also uh, with models uh, looking at how much flow diversion you get depending on how many stent times you have, the design of those, um, and it can get pretty technical. The shape of the windows and the stent um, here, there's different uh, angles in the meshwork, um, and that has different uh, effects on the flow diverting capabilities, um, the length of the of the mesh um, and the shape of those. Um, and so numerous studies have been done which look at the flow diverting effects of, uh, for example, here the enterprise stent, which um, in the early days that was kind of the uh, rudimentary flow diverter, putting multiple overlapping enterprise or neuroform stents. Uh, and then, uh, of course, now with uh, uh, newer devices. And we can see on these mathematical models how much flow diversion you get depending on uh, how you arrange your stents. Um, and you can see with the, with the pipeline there and the silk stent, you're getting significantly more flow diversion than uh, a single enterprise or multiple enterprise. Uh, currently available uh, devices, um, there's, there's different, different ones out there. We've got the uh, Pipeline and Pipeline Flex. Um, that's the newer uh, Covidian device, oh, sorry, Medtronic device um, that we've been using. Um, the Flex device is resheathable. Uh, the Surpass device uh, is currently in trials in the U.S. Um, and there's the FRED device, which is also in, in uh, clinical trials in the U.S. Um, with a microvention. And the Silk Stent has been out in uh, overseas for a long time. There's uh, some new future devices as well um, for intrasacular flow diversion. This is a very exciting uh, device coming down the line. This is the uh, Medina this is it's kind of a hybrid between a coil and a flow diverter. So it's an intrasacular flow diverter where this is uh, essentially these leaves of uh, kind of pipeline-like material um, which fill up the aneurysm and then divert the blood flow um, uh, sort of within, uh, from the, within the aneurysm itself. Uh, Pascal mentioned the Luna device. It's a, sort of a lollipop on a stick design similar to the web uh, for intrasacular flow diversion. This is just an example in, in rabbit. Uh, showing the uh, 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 flow diversion and thrombosis. Uh, and of course, the web device, which uh, Pascal uh, demonstrated uh, just before. Um, there's some technical challenges with delivering this device. I've not used it myself, but uh, I'm just talking to Pascal. It sounds like uh, there are some challenges with that. Uh, here's an example of the device going in with the contrast stasis in the top panel in B. Uh, and you can see in D, there's a neck remnant, uh, which was similar to what was uh, shown in the previous talk. Uh, and unfortunately, the results don't look uh, great so far, uh, about 50% complete occlusion, occlusion rate, uh, some technical challenges in getting the device in. So we're not quite there yet. We'll have to see whether uh, with the learning curve where over time we uh, get improved results with that. Uh, it's been used in the treatment of uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysms. Um, and in this uh, trial, um, there was uh, t 10 aneurysms treated, and I think six were um, uh, Com completely treated, so not a great uh, first shot with that one. I surpassed the um, striker uh, variant on the uh, flow diverting stent. Um, there's a, a trial that's uh, come out on that with very good um, uh, results, 95% uh, occlusion. Um, so again, similar to what we've been seeing with pipeline. This is an example um, of a very large cavernous aneurysm treated with uh, surpass with uh, an excellent result. Uh, and this. Uh, trial that's going on, the scent trial. Um, always dangerous to name a trial scent. Hopefully it smells good at the end. Um, and um, the uh, with the scent trial, one of the differences with the surpass is the uh, the number of wires. For the larger stents, you have more wires. So you get the same flow diverting uh, capability with a larger stent. Uh, and the other difference is the mesh density uh, is more um, 
uniform compared to um, other flow diverters where things kind of change if you have a tapering vessel. Um, and that's thought to increase the flow diverting capabilities. So the uh, FDA approved device that we have in the United States is of course the uh, pipeline device and the uh, pipeline flex, which is the uh, new version of that, um, originally for wide necked uh, uh, aneurysms. Uh, but the off-label use uh, has been widespread for blister type aneurysms, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, dissections, uh, giant aneurysms, and also uh, more frequently now in uh, salvage therapy for previously coiled or uh, clipped aneurysms. It's a, a flexible mesh-like device um, uh, that expands 75% cobalt chromium, uh, 48 strands, and we get about 30 to 35% uh, surface coverage. That's important when we think about uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. The PUFS trial was the main trial uh, for FDA approval um, with a complete aneurysm occlusion rate of uh, close to 75% with a low stroke rate of 5.6%. The five-year data is now out for PUFS uh, with a 95.2% occlusion rate. So this is uh, important. Often we have patients that come in, they get their pipeline we'll do a, a six month angiogram and the aneurysm will be smaller and we're not sure should we retreat it with another device, but now we have the five year data, um, at least in my practice, I've, I've been kind of watching and waiting unless there's a, a regrowth of the aneurysm, because uh, often that small remnant will disappear if you wait long enough. Uh, intrepid trial, 793 patients, similar endpoints, uh, and these are summarized shortly. The ASPIRE trial, 191 patients uh, with uh, standard uh, follow-up. And if we look at the safety data of these trials, um, neurological morbidity and mortality, it's uh, relatively low at 7.8%. Um, and so it's a, a good, um, uh, safe uh, treatment for often very complex aneurysms. Uh, posterior circulation and larger aneurysms seem to have a slightly higher complication rate. Um, that's certainly what uh, is reflected anecdotally. Talking to people, very large aneurysms, obviously more uh, complex to navigate, uh, and posterior circulation aneurysms often very challenging. The perforator coverage, um, the posterior communicating artery is often covered for internal carotid artery aneurysms. That doesn't seem to have any clinical sequelae. Uh, if you've got a large uh, posterior communicating artery, it'll stay open by itself. Uh, if, uh, if it's fetal, for example, um, if the patient doesn't need it because they've got a, a good posterior circulation uh, from the vertebral arteries, then um, the, an the uh, anterior circulation, it may uh, clot off, but it, it fills from uh, the vertebral circulation. So we haven't seen problems with that. Um, in general, covering the uh, ophthalmic segment, uh, Dr. Lanzino published a paper which showed about 15% uh, of the ophthalmic arteries will uh, occlude, but uh, did not see any associated ophthalmic complications. So uh, what tends to happen is if, if the ophthalmic uh, occludes over time, you fill through the face. So the facial collaterals will take over at the same time. And uh, in, in my experience, we haven't seen um, any uh, permanent um, uh, ophthalmic uh, complications. Sometimes people get flashes and floaters and things like that, but um, those seem to disappear. Uh, covering of uh, coverage of the anterior choroidal, it seems covering with one device doesn't seem to cause any problems. Um, I've had a couple of cases where I've had to put two pipelines in where I've had patients that have had uh, TIA-like symptoms that resolve very rapidly. Uh, so perhaps covering with two, two devices or more is uh, an issue there. Uh, once an aneurysm is completely occluded, it's extremely rare for it to rupture. Um, Recanalization is extremely rare. Uh, the early post-treatment rupture uh, has been seen even in aneurysms which have thrombosed. I had not uh, seen that until uh, last week. Um, we had a, a, a superior hypophyseal aneurysm that I treated uh, with a coil as well, and uh, the uh, final run showed um, occlusion of the aneurysm, uh, and about five hours after the procedure, the patient tolerated the procedure great, was doing fine, and then complained of a headache five hours after the operation um, and presumably bled from the aneurysm or perhaps a perforator. Um, it might have been a wire perforation, I'm not sure, but in any case, she's done fine. We've just had to treat vasospasm. The follow-up angiograms show that the aneurysm is completely occluded. Uh, so uh, these things do happen. Uh, for ruptured aneurysms, uh, this is 
a uh, very useful device for dissecting ruptured aneurysms, um, uh, pseudo aneurysms, and uh, blister type aneurysms. And in fact, two days ago, we treated a, a one and a half millimeter uh, ruptured blister type superior hypophyseal aneurysm. Uh, and uh, uh, Adnan's got a, a large series of these as well with uh, about 11 cases. Um, and the results are, are pretty effective for that. Um, these uh, blister type aneurysms, for anyone that's operated on them, the, the results are uh, uniformly dismal in my experience. It's a very challenging procedure where you essentially open the carotid and before you know it, you're looking at the intima of the carotid and the whole thing falls apart in front of you. Um, so very challenging and, and the pipeline's been useful for these. Posterior circulation, this is uh, Dr. McDougall's uh, paper. Uh, initially, uh, um, there was a, a paper that came out from the Buffalo Group which showed uh, some pretty uh, challenging uh, results from posterior circulation pipeline. Um, and um, since then, we, I think we've been a bit more um, selective about uh, which cases we treat in the posterior circulation. Uh, and uh, Dr. McDougall's uh, paper, there's uh, a comment that they didn't treat dolichoectatic uh, aneurysms with this uh, technique. Uh, I think those are uh, an, a an aneurysm we still haven't quite figured out. Flow reversal is probably the key um, aspect of treatment for that, and I'm sure Dr. Lawton is going to talk about that. Um, but uh, pipeline for these uh, fusiform giant basilar aneurysms doesn't seem to work so well. I'll go through that. Versus uh, stent coiling versus flow diversion. Uh, so this paper just demonstrates that actually pipeline is, is better than uh, a routine stent-assisted coiling for uh, ophthalmic aneurysms. There's a lower recurrence rate uh, and is possibly cheaper. Um, in terms of intracerebral hemorrhage, this is from uh, uh, the Buffalo uh, uh, group as well. Um, and one of the risk factors for intracerebral hemorrhage, it happens about 2.5% of the time, uh, is uh, multiple devices uh, and I think that is probably indicative of a more complicated case, so um, uh, that may be an epiphenomenon, but it certainly is indicative of, of treating difficult cases. Uh, this is from the uh, Jefferson Group treatment of small aneurysms, a very high occlusion rate, uh, greater than 90%, uh, and um, this ties in with the, the data that we're seeing internationally. Uh, I typically quote patients a 90 to 95% um, uh, occlusion rate uh, for pipeline. Cranial neuropathy, again, this is from uh, Dr. McDougall's group at, uh, uh, at the Barrow. Um, very uh, uh, acceptable rate of uh, improvement of cranial neuropathy, significantly improved. If you get aneurysm occlusion, uh, those patients are more likely to have uh, improvement in their cranial neuropathy, and that's certainly what I've seen clinically. Just want to go through some technical nuances, uh, how, how we do it and how I do it is how Pascal taught me to do it. Um, so it's one of these things you, you, uh, you learn from your mentors and, and that's the right way. Um, dual antiplatelet therapy, this is more of an art than a science. Uh, the way we do it, we check a uh, Plavix platelet inhibition test or a PRU test before I load the patients on Plavix. About 10% of patients won't respond to Plavix. We put them on Plavix for two weeks with baby aspirin as well. Uh, a couple of days before the procedure, we have a lot of patients from out of town. Um, I'll recheck the uh, PRU, make sure it's therapeutic. If it's not, I'll change them to uh, Berlinta. Uh, and then the day of the procedure, we'll also recheck the uh, Plavix response. We aim for a percentage inhibition of around 30 to 80%. So some patients, uh, the magic number is 207, and some patients, their baseline might be 220, and they go to 205. Uh, that's a patient that concerns me rather than a patient that's gone from a, a baseline of 400 to one of 198. Um, you know, there's a, there's a very big difference in those patients, and that's why we get the baseline. And we'll cancel the case if they're very therapeutic or very non-therapeutic. Some of the things that we think about before we jump in and do a pipeline, is there a high chance that I'm going to have to sacrifice the carotid? Is this a disastrous type uh, procedure? Is a patient had a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Is there a possibility I'm going to have to bail out and sack the carotid? Should I have done a BTO pre-op? Is this someone that uh, we may get into trouble on? Should I have the ability to do a carotid cut down. We have a hybrid suite, we have the ability to do that. Uh, some vessel, vessels are very tortuous to get into and we need good support in order to do this procedure. Uh, our standard setup is an eight French sheath, uh, long sheath. Uh, I use the Penumbra uh, 088 Neuron Max. Some people use a shuttle. 
uh, and then the standard Navian and Marksman setup. You'll see that in the lab shortly. What are my bailout options? What if things aren't going so well? Can I sack the vessel? Can I coil it off? Uh, can I coil the aneurysm? Is it something that I can do with balloon assist or a stent assist? Should I quit and, and clip the aneurysm, come back another day? Uh, is, is there any other collateral access that I can uh, get at this aneurysm from a, a better angle? Um, as I said, the technical nuance is good. Distal support is key. Uh, this will make a bit more sense when you do stuff in, in the lab shortly. Uh, we want to get the microcatheter to a nice straight segment. Um, and uh, there's different techniques on how it should be done. Do we open the stent and drag it back to where it needs to be and then fully deploy it? Do we open it where it should be uh, uh, kind of situated and just push it out exactly where we want it? Should we uh, wag the, the wire to, to move around the, uh, the stent and kind of inflate it into uh, the vessel? Uh, and essentially, we make a little cigar, we uh, drag the catheter back, and then we push out the uh, stent. Uh, and this is one of those things that when you do it in the lab, it makes a whole lot more sense. Uh, because as Pascal was saying, with the coiling, it's all feel. Uh, there's a little bit of, there's obviously visualization, but it's a feel thing. Uh, and this is just the stent coming out. So the cigar is less of an issue with a pipeline flex device because it's supposed to pop off by itself like this. Um, and as we keep pushing the wire out, more and more pipeline gets pushed out. And it's at this point, uh, we can, what we mean by wagging the, the catheter is holding the wire and the catheter and, and pushing these two things uh, forward and back. And that will kind of inflate the stent into the vessel and fill the space. Uh, and then we just keep pushing out the uh, stent until it's uh, fully delivered and then recapture the wire. Post-op, we have um, some things that we do that are a little bit different. Um, we have very strict blood pressure control. We keep the patients, um, keep their legs straight. Uh, you know, there's a big sheath, they're on aspirin, plavix. We've got heparin, which wears off. We pull the sheath in the uh, ICU. Uh, we let the heparin wear off, and then once that's worn off, we pull the sheath in the ICU. That means if we have problems with closure, we can actually uh, deal with those without the patient fully heparinized. It's very challenging if you have a sheath fallout with a patient fully heparinized. I don't like giving protamine in the setting of a, of a fresh pipeline. The other thing we do that's a little bit different, uh, TCD emboli monitoring. Um, we've got fantastic uh, TCDs. The Spencer Lab, which invented the TCD, is um, in this building, and um, we've got really good techs. And one of the things they can do is um, emboli monitoring. And emboli monitoring has been shown in numerous studies to be highly predictive of impending stroke. Uh, and what we do is we look for what we call microembolic signatures. And they're little micro clots that are flying into the brain. They're clinically insignificant and in that the patient doesn't notice anything, but we know that that's a sign that there's some clot forming on the stent. And a few microembolic signatures is not a concern. We just usually repeat the TCD. Uh, if it starts creeping up, if we're getting 30 or 50 uh, microembolic signatures an hour, that patient is going to have a stroke. And we've had uh, at least three of my patients where they've been therapeutic on uh, aspirin and Plavix, we've done the procedure, and in the recovery room, they're completely fine. We've done the uh, TCD emboli monitoring, and they've had positive emboli. Those patients will heparinize overnight, uh, and usually by uh, morning, uh, the emboli has completely disappeared. Um, and we know uh, that if we don't do that, uh, it's very likely they're going to have a stroke. So embolic complications, we watch those with aspirin, Plavix, have to be therapeutic, Make sure your heparinization is good during the procedure. Uh, avoidance of hemorrhagic complications, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage. Make sure you're not too therapeutic on aspirin plavix. Uh, you have to be careful with the um, uh, blood pressure. We keep them uh, less than 140 systolics. Uh, access complications are uh, standard. No retroperitoneal hematoma. Make sure the groin stick's low. Again, the patients are on aspirin plavix. That's really important. Uh, and device-related complications. Uh, all sorts of things can happen. Um, the device can't open. Sometimes it'll twist. Uh, it'll intussocept. It can get stenosis. Uh, it can thrombose. Uh, here's some illustrative cases. Um, this is just a. This is sort of your standard uh, pipeline uh, patient. Um, this is an ugly-looking aneurysm, two lobes, and then there's a secondary uh, superior hypophyseal aneurysm. This is treated with one uh, pipeline device in the middle, and then you can see the six-month follow-up. It's treated both aneurysms nicely. 
Um, this is a 70 year old who came in with uh, headaches with this cavernous, uh, partly cavernous, partly ophthalmic aneurysm that we treat with one device. That's, that's generally been my um, technique. That's why I was trained. We generally use one device. Um, some places are a bit more aggressive in putting in two. Uh, we've had good success with one. This is a 52 year old with a, a ptosis and ophthalmoplegia who had bilateral, uh, very challenging aneurysms, this giant cavernous aneurysm on the left uh, uh, with ophthalmoplegia, and then also on the right, um, we've got this um, ophthalmic and cavernous aneurysm. Uh, so what we did with this one, we did a, a BTO. Uh, we actually tried to pipeline the left side, uh, but the, uh, we were not able to get into the outflow. Uh, so we did uh, a BTO before we did that procedure to see if we couldn't pipeline it. We, we knew our bailout option was to sack the carotid, uh, and that's exactly what we did. She tolerated that well. Uh, and then we brought her back um, a few days later and pipelined the right side. Uh, and you can see at six months, she's got good cross-filling uh, to the contralateral side. Uh, both aneurysms are completely treated um, with, a, with a good clinical outcome. This is an 80-year-old that came in with a visual field cut. Um, it was a large aneurysm. It's been our practice, and aneurysms greater than about a centimeter, I'll generally try and throw in a coil or two. It doesn't have to be packed as densely as you would with a stent-assisted coiling. The flow diverting effect of the pipeline is significant. Um, but there's some, some data that, to suggest that for larger aneurysms, you can get a, a ball valve effect where uh, blood gets into the aneurysm and it can't get out. And maybe in these larger aneurysms, uh, they can pop. Uh, so it's been my practice to put in a few coils in those cases. Um, and uh, this was uh, two, two pipelines um, to overlap uh, and we had immediate contrast stasis, uh, and at six months, there's a complete obliteration of the aneurysm with uh, improvement in the visual field. This is a 32-year-old who had a, a remote history of trauma, came in with a giant petrus, uh, likely dissecting aneurysm. Uh, and again, the same thing, we loosely packed this uh, and, um, and put in a pipeline. Um, it would be remiss of me not to disclose that uh, this was a patient who... Um, the procedure went, went great. He was therapeutic on Plavix. Uh, then in the recovery room, we did the emboli monitoring, and he was flicking off 200 microembolic signatures an hour, uh, doing fine. So th this is the sort of patient that I think without that, that technology, we would have uh, said, okay, he's doing great. Uh, we heparinized him. We rechecked a Plavix response, and for whatever reason, he had become non-responsive to his Plavix. Um, we changed him over to Berlinta, um, and unfortunately then he had a small cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage, so we backed off on the Berlinta, uh, and then he developed a clot in the, in the stent, uh, which we solitaired uh, successfully, and he's actually made a, a good recovery and graduated from college and is, and is uh, doing very well. Uh, but you know, these can be very tricky cases, uh, and the, management, the medical management of these patients is, uh, it's, um, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and with the Plavix, if I can, uh, we try and do, as I said, two weeks or three weeks of Plavix because sometimes these people out of nowhere become non-responders. Uh, this is a 72-year-old man that came in with diplopia. You can see he's got a mass uh, pushing in on his brain stem uh, and it's this uh, ugly looking uh, vertebro basilar aneurysm. I uh, got some advice from uh, my mentors on this one, uh, whether to just pipeline or put some coils in. Again, it's a large aneurysm, but we want to minimize the mass effect. So we loosely packed this and placed uh, two pipelines. It's a little hard to see. It's not projecting so well, um, but there's two, there's two pipelines there uh, with a pipeline flex. Um, and he also had an ophthalmic aneurysm that I uh, pipelined uh, a couple of months later, and, and the um, vert aneurysm is completely occluded with improvement in diplopia. This is a 52-year-old with complete ophthalmoplegia, had this giant cavernous aneurysm, uh, and this is treated uh, just with pipeline, uh, and this is a six-month follow-up. It's almost completely gone, uh, but with complete resolution of the symptoms. Um, and you know, if we think back to what we would have been doing uh, five or 10 years ago, it would have had to have been a bypass or something like that. This is a, uh, really a game changer. This is a 58-year-old with a third nerve palsy, uh, and headaches. She was adamant she did not want surgery. 
um, with a third nerve palsy that does tend us towards uh, uh, doing surgery, although as uh, Cameron's group has shown, you can get resolution with pipeline. Um, we were wary about putting in too many coils uh, to treat this, but it's so large, I felt very uncomfortable just putting in a pipeline device. So with this setup, we jail the microcatheter behind the pipeline, uh, and uh, and that way we can coil behind the pipeline. You can't put a microcatheter through the interstices of the pipe. Uh, and so this was uh, the six-month angio with coils uh, demonstrating complete resolution. Uh, with uh, fusiform aneurysms, this is uh, from uh, the Jefferson group. This is one of Pascal's cases that uh, we did as a, uh, did as a fellow. Uh, this is a uh, large or giant fusiform MCA aneurysm that was treated with uh, pipeline and uh, again, loose coils with an excellent six month uh, follow up result. And we also use it finally for uh, salvage of uh, clipped aneurysms. This is a superior hypophyseal aneurysm uh, that uh, had some residual, uh, and we can put the pipeline through that, and it's an excellent treatment for that. Uh, carotid injury, uh, very useful adjunct. This is a 46 year old that had a pituitary adenoma resected. There was a torrential uh, bleeding. Anyone that's seen that knows what we're talking about. Uh, the nose is packed off taken directly to angio. It's a good illustrative case. You can see this narrowing of the carotid uh, from the packing. Um, so it's really important you follow these patients up. So we took her back a couple of days later. This is what the angio looked like two days later. And you can see there's a very small uh, uh, rent in the, in the carotid medially, uh, which is the little pseudoaneurysm. Uh, so we treated this with pipeline um, and uh, this is a six-month follow-up angiogram, and, and she did well from that without any neurological sequelae. So in conclusion, it's another tool in the toolbox. Uh, not every case is suitable, and as was uh, uh, alluded to in the previous talk, uh, it's a tailored treatment. So pipeline's not great for everyone. Just because you, you think it's cool doesn't mean it's uh, cool for the right patient, uh, for the wrong patient. Um, it has a good safety profile in the right cases, uh, and it's useful in salvage, uh, but of course there's a learning curve and it's important that you learn how to use these devices in a, a safe environment with uh, uh, experienced people that can help you get out of trouble. And any questions on that? Mm -hmm.